This hearing will come to order. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses for joining us today. Very glad to have you. In his very first inaugural address, President Thomas Jefferson defined good government as one that shall restrain men from injuring one another and shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement. This pro-liberty standard, embraced by our founding fathers and the Constitution, has served us well. Today, the United States stands as the most powerful and prosperous nation in history, a beacon of hope to people throughout the world. But there is a growing sense among many that our nation is in decline. We have now seen years of sluggish economic growth, stagnant household income, the largest percentage of Americans not working since 1977. Far too many people who have simply given up any hope of having a job, of starting a business, of having a future. Entrepreneurship, truly one of America's defining traits, is hurting badly. It is a tough time to own a small business in America today. The last several decades have seen a dramatic decline in the rate of business formation. Business deaths now outpace business births. That is a deeply troubling trend in our nation. One that stands in direct opposition to the promise of America as a land where anyone can start with nothing and achieve anything. And on top of that, the United States now ranks 46th in the world when it comes to the ease of starting a new business. 46th. That's hard to imagine. Why is that? What's gone wrong? We are here today to discuss a major part of the problem. Government overregulation. It is axiomatic that the larger and more intrusive government becomes, the smaller and more docile we the people are forced to become. There is no greater obstacle to growth, to opportunity and prosperity for all Americans than an invasive and bloated government. Ronald Reagan understood this. It is no coincidence, he said, that our present troubles parallel and are proportionate to the intervention and intrusion in the lives that result from unnecessary and excessive growth of government. The federal government, and sadly many states, no longer adhere to the Jeffersonian standard of leaving the people free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement. <laughs> Instead, they now seemingly regulate everything under the sun. 55 years ago, there were 13 regulatory federal government agencies. Today, there are over 70. 55 years ago, the Code of Federal Regulations contained 23,000 pages, a sizable amount. Today, the Code of Federal Regulations takes up an astounding 175,000 pages and 235 volumes, all in incredibly small print. Somehow the American people are expected to comply with 175,000 pages of regulations that no one person can even begin to understand. The, this figure dwarfs the number of statutes actually enacted by Congress, the body that the Constitution entrusted with making our laws. Federal statutes today take up over 40 volumes and 50,000 pages, about a quarter the length of the federal regulations. Although an inexact science Estimates of federal regulations are estimated to increase costs 
up to possibly $2 trillion a year. Is it any wonder we have the economic stagnation, so many millions hurting? When the federal government is putting $2 trillion a year of costs on small businesses, on those trying to create jobs and opportunity. And unfortunately, the media far too often writes off over regulation as a trifling issue because they believe it only concerns giant corporations, not everyday people. This hearing is about shining the light on the true people paying the price for government overregulation. Truth be told, overregulation harms everyone but it especially harms those who don't have the resources or political connections to get a special exemption, to have a lobbyist, to get a favor from government. And far too often, those are minorities. African Americans, Hispanics, single moms, people who are struggling but want to start a small business, want to stand on their own feet, want to provide for their family. And the burden of federal regulation makes it harder and harder and harder to do exactly that. Peter Curzonow is the longest serving member of the United States Civil Rights Commission. He's an African American, and at a hearing very much like this held 20 years ago, Commissioner Curzonow said this, regulations affect all businesses. <laughs> but they have a particularly pernicious effect on small businesses, on businesses that are marginally capitalized, are labor intensive, or are perceived as being credit risks. A disproportionate share of those businesses are owned by minorities and by black Americans. Unfortunately, 20 years later, overregulation remains and has become an even bigger obstacle to the success and prosperity of those who are struggling to achieve the American dream. Revenues for minority-owned small businesses still, unfortunately, lag behind revenues for non-minority-owned businesses. And yet, minority-owned businesses must absorb regulatory costs of roughly $7,000 to $10,000 per employee, just like any other small business. What this means is that regulatory costs have a more severe impact on the bottom line of minority businesses than other businesses, making it more difficult for minority businesses to grow and hire more employees. The regulation epidemic in this country certainly hasn't translated into more jobs and prosperity for minorities, especially since President Obama has taken office. The median household income for African Americans and Hispanics, for instance, has remained virtually unchanged since President Obama was elected, meaning that there has been no recovery since the 2008 crash. And poverty rates for African Americans have gone up. African American unemployment remains almost double that of non-minorities, non as it has for over 50 years. And there are together roughly a million fewer working age African Americans and Hispanics employed today than when the president took office. Let me repeat that statistic. There are together roughly one million fewer working age African Americans and Hispanics employed today than when the president took office. That's roughly one million lives impacted, plus their children, plus their families. People who want to work, want to provide for their families, and yet are being denied that opportunity. It's estimated that for every additional one million dollars that the government spends enforcing its regulations, the economy loses 420 private sector jobs. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. Curbing excessive government regulation shouldn't be a partisan issue. We should be able to find a way to stem the tide of red tape, to loosen the burdens on small businesses that are struggling to create opportunities without weakening essential protections for our society. Not all regulations are bad. 
but a wall of regulations descending from Washington on small businesses and crushing job creation is making it harder and harder for people who are struggling to achieve the American dream. I want to thank each of you for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. We have today seven witnesses. The first witness, Mr. Michael Barrera, a Kansas City-based attorney with over 30 years of business, legal, nonprofit, and government experience. A graduate of Kansas State and the Texas Law School, he serves as the National Economic Prosperity Manager for the Libre Institute, a nonprofit that promotes economic freedom in the U.S. Hispanic community. Before joining Libre, Mr. Barrera served as the President and CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and prior to that, as the National Ombudsman for the U.S. Small Business Administration. Our second witness is Amit Narang, an expert on the federal regulatory process, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and the American University, Washington College of Law. Mr. Narang is a regulatory policy advocate for Public Citizen, a nonprofit public interest organization founded by Ralph Nader. Timothy Sandifer is an Arizona-based attorney who specializes in economic liberty and constitutional law. A graduate of Hillsdale College and Chapman Law School, Mr. Sandifer currently serves as the principal attorney for the Pacific Legal Foundation, where he is the lead attorney in the PLF's Economic Liberty Project. William Scott is the CEO of Tri-States LLC, a community and economic development consulting company in Selma, Alabama. Educated at Alabama State University and Troy University Montgomery, Mr. Scott is a former mayor and council member of the town of Massas, Alabama, and a veteran of the United States Army. Thank you, Mr. Scott, for your service. Sabrina Loving is a Chicago-based small business owner, a graduate of Robert Morris College and Roosevelt University. Ms. Loving runs Loving Tax Services Incorporated, a tax preparation service she started five years ago to assist individual and small business clients with their tax returns. Aaron Mayer is the 57th president of the Sierra Club, one of the nation's premier environmental organizations. He became a member in 1999 and has held numerous leadership positions within the organization since 2002. And Henry Alford is a DC-based business leader, a former Wisconsin football player and army officer. Thank you for your service as well. Mr. Alford currently serves as president and CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce, which he founded with his wife Kay over 20 years ago. Prior, prior to founding NBCC, Mr. Alford worked for several Fortune 100 companies. We'll now have an opening statement from Mr. Coons. Thank you, Chairman Cruz.